All right, here we go, guys. Sorry about that. That was the old song of the day, which was Immigrant Song by Led Zeppelin. Uh, we are moving on. The big key part now in Unit 9. This is, by the way, Lecture 2. The uh, big thing, key thing for Unit 9 now is the differences between the North and the South. And we've talked about in the past how they do not get along well with each other. They've argued all the time just about how different they both are, the makeup of the plantation economy or city life and factories now that are coming into it with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the big key is that Ever since the Constitutional Convention, there's been an argument over slavery and the differences between the North and South and fighting over representation and who gets more of everything. It sounds like little kids at Christmas time. Uh, the big key here is that we're going to go over how the North was, how the South was, so that you can compare and contrast those tomorrow in class. Uh, you already did the uh, packet for me in class, which kind of gave you that bar graph or the pie charts where you could kind of set up who had more wealth, who had more access to everything. So keep that in mind while we go through these notes today. Here we go. Uh, starting up at the top, you see that the North has 22 million people, with the average being 98% of that 22 million being white Americans. Uh, there are 24 total states, Missouri and Kentucky, being part of the North, even though they allow slavery. They are different. They will fight for the North when the Civil War breaks out, but they do allow slavery. They are called border states. Uh, the Industrial Revolution is something that very much changes the North. It brought factories to the North. We've talked about canals and how they connect the major cities. Factories will be part of city life in one big way. And 92% of the factories happen to be in the North when the war breaks out, which is a huge plus for the North, having the idea of having these factories or having these factories gets them the ability to mass produce bullets, guns, weapons. Uh, they can mass produce the uniforms that they're going to wear and everything else. So factories is a huge plus to have in the north, which they have almost nine out of every ten factories. Uh, fewer farms are located in the north, even though they do have farms that produce food. The big idea about plantations, the north does not have plantations. They focus on factories. Uh, the one of the big inventions at the time was a steel plow by a man named John Deere. He was probably colored yellow and green. But John Deere was a man who invented a steel plow, which just pretty much walked behind a horse or ox and dug up the ground for you. So instead of you physically, a person, having to go around with like a pickaxe, kind of digging into the ground, now you have something that can you can just walk behind an ox or a horse, and they do it for you. So having the ability to have better technology makes more and more the need the need for slaves in the north was unneeded you had these steel plows that helped on the farms so fewer farms in the north but they did have farms that produced food for them but the steel plow helps that out mccormick's reaper is another thing uh if you ever really truly see mccormick's reaper run or try to wake up hopefully you don't see them uh, but if you know what McCormick Reaper is, it's just a large kind of scythe. That's what it's called. It's a blade on a stick, and it helped to cut down crops. So again, these inventions are helping make things better, like anything else. Can you imagine all of your lives without a cell phone? I'm going to give you a minute to think about that. No, I can't. It would freak me out if I didn't have a cell phone, let alone if you guys didn't have cell phones. You would actually have to physically get outside and go talk to your friends again instead of having all your fake friends on Facebook. Uh, looking next is the telegraph, which was invented by a man named Samuel Morris, which used Morse code, which are the little dot noises. But the telegraph, you see the picture down here. Here is the telegraph right down there. And it connected to wires that are pictured here that look like electrical wires. And it sent out a little electrical pulse, which is Morse code. And it would be letters that you can now communicate with others hundreds of miles away almost instantaneous. So just like you guys can text message your friends or send instant messages or whatever, you have the first instance of that here in America with a telegraph. So now what's happening in South Carolina, you can read about in Massachusetts by the next day. So newspapers are current. You're not waiting days or sometimes weeks to get news. News is traveling the country in a few seconds to a couple minutes. Uh, the railroad helps that as well. Wagon train travel is gone. Now you're using the railroads. We've talked about the Transcontinental Railroad being one of them. Another way that the northern cities develop quicker, the railroads, most of them, three-fourths three of them, will be in the north, which allows them to move products faster from factory to factory. Uh, working in a factory was a tough life. Like it says up here, you get low pay, 4 to $6 per week with little to no vacation time. You work 60 to 70 hours a week, 6 to 7 days a week. If you needed time off, you got fired and somebody new took your place. 
If you asked for time off, again, you got fired and somebody new took your place. Uh, the conditions were poor. There were no unions helping out people. Uh, they, the factory owners paid the smallest amount of money possible to you to work. If you, could, if you only needed 2 to $3 a week to survive, you were going to get a job over somebody who needed 4 to $6 because there was no laws limiting what the owners had to pay you. So the conditions were poor. Most of the kids, like, or most of the people working, a third of them were actually children because, again, they could pay you less, and you're going to do the same work as someone else. So immigrants, children, uh, free African Americans in the North, those are the people who had these factory jobs, and they feared slavery ending. Uh, unions tried to organize to get them better rights, better working conditions at the factories, try to get better pay overall. Moving on, song of the daytime. All right, if you don't know yet, it is a phenomenal 80s band. Um, moving on, the immigrants flood the north. You have lots of people moving to the north. Again, there is a picture on the bottom of what a northern city would look like, connected by canals or railroads or roads or rivers. But those transportation ideas would bring goods from factory to factory to help grow the cities. Uh, most immigrants or free African Americans or anybody took to the north or took to the north's big cities to get a factory job. You do not need an education for that. It was easy pay, easy money. It's guaranteed money, whereas at a farm, if there's a drought or it's not raining, you don't get paid. So factories are going to be open 365 days a year. You're going to make money if you go there. It's not great money, but it is guaranteed money. So the immigrants came to the north. You see four and a half, almost million people flood the north from 1840 to 1860. They go to the big cities like New York, Chicago, Cleveland, and they would have places like in, I give you the example for letter B, the Irish come over with a potato famine. So the Irish come over and they develop a little area of the city called Little, I little Italy or Little Ireland, and you'd have those groups, the Italians or the Irish, fighting against each other for who controls areas of the city. It's almost like gang violence, but it's all about where they come from back in Europe. Uh, the immigrants were called the North Slaves. They were treated badly. There was prejudice against them. Uh, I already mentioned that there was that clash where they had like gangs almost to see who, who in a way controlled areas of the city. You had to wait in America or live here for five years in order to vote. Some people, you know, Americans that have lived here all their lives, wanted it to be 21 years of straight living here just to vote. Uh, the free blacks had lots of prejudice and racism against them. They went to separate jobs, separate schools. They did not have the right to vote. And then you had the chosen people in the North, the wealthy factory owners, the people who they sent their kids off to private schools, their kids went to Yale or Harvard to learn how to run the business, come back, you know, when mom and dad pass away, you get the family factory, you get a great house, they're going to be lawyers and doctors and have government jobs. That's vastly different than the students or kids from the South, the wealthy kids in the South and how they'll grow up. But for the North, your goal own the factory like mom and dad. All right, back to song of the day. Ah, oh, if you still haven't guessed it yet, the lead singer has crazy orange hair. Okay, moving on. The South we're on now on the bottom is the South. They are called the Cotton Kingdom. You guys will get a worksheet on that tomorrow, I believe. There is the states or there are these states that are represented in the South. They have 9.1 million people, 63% of them being white Americans. There are 11 states in the South as well. And if you look, you would say, wow, the North has 24 states and the South has 11. I'm good in math. But the South, the 11 states they have are enormous states on a map. The North has small states like Rhode Island. It's barely a state. It's like the size of Mentor. But the, the area on a map, the South takes up just as much or more on a map than the North does, but that's because they have huge plantations limiting their the size of their not limiting but having the size of their states those are made up of huge plantations in the south one of the big inventions is by a northerner his name is eli whitney he's painted right over here his invention was this what looks like a popcorn maker it's called the cotton gin and what it does is it sifts out the seeds from the cotton you put the cotton in and then you just kind of grind the cotton with the little lever and out pops the cotton the seeds are kind of taken out of it if you could imagine taking just cotton balls and putting seeds inside and having to sift through them with your fingers, that's previously how you had to pick cotton. 
with the cotton gin, all of a sudden now, one person could do the work of a thousand people or slaves. And because of that stat, cotton becomes even bigger in the South. And now the boom for cotton is huge. And more and more plantations want to grow cotton because it, it makes you so much money. So you would think that the, this product, the cotton gin, would make it less popular to have slavery, but it actually makes it more popular because more people want to have in their plantations cotton. And then they just buy the cotton gins and use it to plant more and more of this cotton to sell to the factories in the north. So the Cotton Kingdom is the nickname for the South, all the way from South Carolina to Texas. They also grew tobacco, rice, and sugar. These are called cash crops, crops sold for money. Uh, there are groups of whites in the South as well. The three groups that you have are the planter class. The planters are the rich plantation owners of the South. They would own 50 or more slaves. They would hire an overseer, somebody that would watch over the slaves and kind of beat them if need be or just watch over them. Uh, they would own the plantations themselves. Their kids, instead of being lawyers and doctors, would go on to be soldiers at West Point. Uh, you have the second group, which are the small farmers. The small farmers are most of the whites in the South, 75% of them. They would own 10 to 40 slaves. They would not beat their slaves. They would treat their slaves almost as equals. They would work on the fields with their slaves as well. So most of the population of the South were small farmers, even though northern abolitionists didn't want you to know that. You also have the poor whites who are called sharecroppers. They shared or rented the farmland on a plantation. Their job was to grow the vegetables and food to feed the people of the plantation. They did not grow cash crops, they grew the food. All right, there you go. The title of the song is Paradise City by the band Guns N' Roses. Uh, the last two groups in the South are the Free Blacks. And like you see, by 1860, the start of the Civil War, 215,000 Free Blacks lived in the South. They were good contributors. They bought into the economy, paid in for things. They tried to go get jobs. But there is huge amounts of prejudice and racism against them. They paid special taxes. They would live in separate areas. They had to carry cards to show that they were free. At any time, if they were caught for breaking a law, they could be sold to slavery. The slaves themselves, here are some extreme pictures of what they would have to go through. By the Civil War, 1860, there are four million slaves in the South, which is a third of their total population. They would work in the fields, they would be servants, they would be skilled craftspeople, sometimes they would take care of kids. But if you look, here are some extreme cases of what they would go through. These are two different whips that overseers would use if you could not or did not follow directions or even work hard enough. So imagine like your teachers walking around and if you weren't doing your work, you know, completely or well-written sentences or whatever in class or getting it done fast enough, imagine teachers walking around being able to hit you with these, which would cause everybody in class to work a little more efficiently if that did happen. Uh, you get to see this man over here had his back with this. These are just scar tissue marks on his back from being whipped over and over again. You'd have this slave on the bottom wearing a contraption that would basically stop them from being able to communicate they couldn't eat, but yet they could drink water, which would keep them alive for two to three weeks. Uh, you have this gentleman who probably tried to es escape as shackled to himself, so he'd sit out in the baking sun all day long. And if worse came to worse, you could have the iron collar, which would be kept on you. You couldn't lean or lay down. It would catch on things out there where you could not stop to, you know, if you got caught up in anything, the people would be able to catch you coming after you and sometimes they would have bells on your head as well to catch you they'd have rottweilers or dogs coming to find you as well so those are some extreme cases of what the slaves went through not all slaves went through this but some extreme things that again the abolitionists wanted to point out hopefully you took some notes today and are ready for tomorrow happy night